Well, it's good to sit down. You know, many people are too busy to explore the old city of Geneva, and yet it's got some fantastic stories to tell. Here in the Rough Guide to Switzerland, in the history section on Geneva, it talks about two people in particular who've had an extraordinary influence on the development of the city. And they are John Calvin and Henry Junon. Let's ask one or two people to tell us about their story, their lives and legacy, and how they might inspire us today. William Farrell, whose statue is behind me to your left, was a red-headed French evangelist, and he came to Geneva at a key time in its history. This city was wide open to change. In his preaching of the gospel, in the cathedral, in the squares of the city, was the spark that launched the Protestant Reformation in the French-speaking part of Europe. But Farrell knew that the work had just begun. He knew that the city needed a pastor, a builder, and he was not that person. He heard one day that John Calvin was spending the night in an inn down by the lake. Went down and tried to recruit him. Calvin said, no, I've got my studies. I wanna, I'm physically weak, I'm sick all the time, I can't stay. Farrell stood up and said, may God curse you in your studies if you do not join me here in the work that he has appointed us to. So Calvin trembled at that, wrote about that event till the, till the end of his life, stayed, and history was changed. When John Calvin accepted the challenge of rebuilding the city of Geneva on the principles of the Word of God, he did it with a three-pronged strategy. The ongoing public proclamation of the gospel, because for him personal conversion to Jesus Christ was the beginning of everything. Teaching people how to live, and accountability for every individual and institution in the city. A lot of his teaching happened here in this chapel next to the cathedral. Let me give you a couple examples. One of his first strategies was rebuilding the family because it had fallen apart. He taught a lot on how parents should be responsible for their families. They should save their money. They should commit to paying for the children's education. Every kid, no matter from what level of society, even girls were taught how to read, and the school they built in his lifetime still stands and is being used as a school by the city of Geneva. But he also taught in economic areas. He taught about work. Work being your worship and hard, honest work being the very foundation of Christian activity. He taught about how banks should run their affairs. He told the bankers, you have to lower your interest rates because they're ruining people. And when they lowered them to 4%, that low stable interest rate became one of the cornerstones of Swiss prosperity. And Geneva, with these teachings and practicing them, went from poverty to prosperity in one generation. Of course, Reformation was a process, and there were many attempts all around Europe. But Geneva was a special place where Calvin brought a totally new way of understanding God and spirituality. This is why there were many people coming to this place, either to know more about this new way of being Christian, or because in their countries there were wars and they wanted to take and to find a refuge here. They came with their skills, their artisan, uh, they were watchmakers, bankers, and so on. And this is when the international uh, enlightenment of Geneva started. John Calvin spent the last 20 years of his life in the house behind me, where he died in 1564. Nearly 300 years later, in a house just round the corner from here, a young man grew up who was going to have an incredible impact as well on the life and the reputation of the city of Geneva. His name was Henry Dunon. The Dunons were an affluent Genevan family, very Calvinist and strongly committed to social work. So Henri grew up in a church going home, but aged 18, he was touched by the evangelical Reve movement. And it was right here in the Oratoire that Dunon gave his life to the Lord. Almost at once he founded the Thursday Association, which was a group of like-minded young men who met for Bible study and to help the poor. Along with that, he developed a strong hatred of slavery and then, still aged only 24, co-founded the Geneva YMCA. Then he joined one of Geneva's largest banks and five years later made a daring purchase of a large tract of land in Algeria on which to raise cattle and grain. However, he hit problems and was unable to get water piped from government-owned land. 
So he decided to go to the very top, which meant taking his plea direct to Emperor Napoleon III. Now, at that time, June 1859, Napoleon was in Solferino, Italy, leading the French army against the Austrians. And do not arrive the day after one of Europe's bloodiest battles in which more than 40,000 were killed or injured. He immediately got involved in helping local people look after wounded from both sides and in arranging supplies. But then back in Geneva, he was haunted by what he'd seen. He called it indescribably hideous and wrote a book called A Memory of Solferino, in which he suggested that countries around the world should form an organization to provide help to victims of war. And this led to the founding of what became the Red Cross. Then a year later, largely through his tireless efforts, the same group organized an international conference to discuss the possibility of making warfare more humane. And in August 1864, the representatives of 12 nations signed the first of the Geneva Conventions. So in just five years, Dunant saw a personal vision transformed into an international treaty. But only three years later, still not yet 40, Dunant went bankrupt, largely due to neglecting his business because of his many social concerns. He was ostracized by Genevan society as a bankrupt, and so he left the city to spend the remaining 43 years of his life mostly in poverty and in obscurity. Though at the end of his life, he was once again recognized as he was awarded the first Nobel Peace Prize in 1901. After the International Red Cross was founded and the nations came to the city to sign the Geneva Convention, it became known as a place where nations could get together. Switzerland was also neutral, not part of the international power blocks. Then after World War I, the League of Nations was headquartered here, and that organization eventually became the United Nations, and Geneva became a place where nations could meet, talk together, agree, and change history. What might these two brief biographical sketches tell us? How can the lives of Calvin and Dunant inspire us as we come to work in the city of Geneva today. For Calvin, one thing was very important, is to do something from your life, is to do something with all the skills which had been given to you. I think that coming in Geneva is also to ask ourselves, uh, what can I bring, what I shall bring to the whole community with my entire life, not just with my work, not just with my family, with, but with all my personality. This is, so to speak, to be faithful of that reformation trend. The Red Cross movement was far beyond anything that as a young banker Dunant would ever have imagined, even with all his vision and energy. But it was the consequence of living out a biblical worldview and then being willing to sit light on a career in order to follow God's leading. The challenge for many gifted people who come to Geneva, the city of Reformation, is to dare to look at the ongoing needs of Reformation in the world today and to invite God to use them however he would wish to. It may well affect their future career as it did for Dunant, but God may also use them in ways far beyond anything they might ever think or imagine. The lives of John Calvin and Henri Dunant show us that one person can make a difference not only in the city of Geneva, but among the nations. You can make a difference too coming to Geneva. I suggest three possible ways. One is your prayers. So many important decisions are made in the city that affect the entire world. We need to be praying into them. Another one is your witness. Vladimir Ilyich Lenin came to Geneva in the early 20th century, spent many months here, and never heard the gospel. That century would have been very different, and ours also, if someone had shared their faith with them. Who around you needs to hear the gospel? A third area is your professional life. A committed Christian sharing his convictions peaceably and winsomely, attractively, can make a huge difference in some of the decisions made in your organization that are having a big impact on lots of people. I encourage you, make a difference in Geneva during your time here.